in for a ride. What can I say? This is Grown Up Story Time. My name is Corey Ann Moffat. This is Call Me More. <laughs> Check it in with that. And we're here to bring you an evening of stories written by you, read by people from your community, and here for you. Anybody can write, anybody can read. So this is here for you, so it's whatever you make it. We don't have themes or topics. We just want to know what's on your mind. What's, what are you pulling apart in your brains? Fact, fiction, sci-fi, erotica, please. Okay, um, so uh, for our first story, I am so excited to bring up. The story is called Level Up. It is written by Joan Casson, and it is going to be read by Marilyn Jones Taylor. Hello, dear everyone. Not all the glitters is gold, said Roxanne as she held her arm across the chest of her partner, stopping her only moments from grabbing the shiny object on the mantle. But what's wrong this time? I mean, it's what we came all this way for. I'm not going back to start again, said Sylvana, furious at being held from glory who is a mere inches away from her fingertips. Through squinted eyes, Roxanne moved toward the object, sizing it up, trying to glimmer some, some sort of information from the object's body but receiving no new data aside from the obvious. Round, floating, sparkling, and somehow illuminated from within. With a furrowed brow, she flipped around her flashlight and slowly attempted to prod the orb with the butt. As it moved closer to the end of the flashlight, liquefied and melted like molten lava. Roxanne handed what remained of the flashlight to Sylvana, who was now thanking her lucky stars that she still had hands to receive it with. The orb at eye level now, Roxanne had a hunch, the thought shining as brightly as the orb that, in that glint she always gets in her eye when she thinks she's the most clever person in the room. With a slight sideways head pitch, she puckered her lips and blew. At that moment, the orb shined ever brighter and shuddered as though it were at the edge of a small force field. Another smile, this time doubly smug. Roxanne inhaled like she was trying to suck the orb into her lungs and then blew out as hard as she could. The orb waffled for a moment at the edge of the field and then fell off and into Roxanne's extended hand. Success! Suddenly, sirens blared. The deafening sound of an alarm filled the room and yellow lights flashed and spun. This signaled the end of the game. As the room around them faded away back into the memory banks of the whole run, and the orb all but evaporated from Roxanne's hand. In a hidden amphitheater, two small figures sat behind one-way glass in the stadium seats they'd occupied while watching the challenge below. Both women, each in their 80s, wore stark field jackets as aged as they were and held clipboards on their laps scrawled with notes in every margin. She's the one. Damned if I didn't want her to be, but she is, no question about it, said the first from behind thick Coke bottle glasses with elegant black blank frames that covered most of her face. She'd been playing the game for a long time, but she hadn't yet given up hope for a win. Agreed, said the smaller of the two. Her combat-worn, many-pocketed coat engulfed her tiny frame, though her hair was still pinned to perfection. Even in these times, one must put in some effort. They looked simultaneously cut from steel, 
and like a strong gust of wind could blow them over and neither can pass height requirements for a festival ride. God help us, that girl has an appetite for trouble but she's the best damn puzzle solver we've got. If we have any hope of getting out of here, she's it. The end puzzle has had us bamboozled since we were her age. I know it, I just get nervous about her. She'll only have one shot at it. Reminds me too much of Angela with that ego of hers. We all got wrapped up in Angela's confidence. I was just as convinced as anyone. She stared at the space where Roxanne stood only moments ago. We all know how that ended. Sure do. With her in the black hole and us right here, still stuck in the damn game. The two women stayed in their seats, locked in memory for a long time. Memory and regret. Roxanne sat on her bunk to unlace her combat boots and rest her aching shoulders for the night. As she pulled off her second shoe, the two women, known only as the firsts, stood gazing at her with expressionless faces. Their tiny frames brought Roxanne's eyes to meet their own, even though she was still sitting down. It's time, girl, it's you said the one whose glasses couldn't possibly be helping her see. They were both so small, so frail, but clearly tough as steel, hardened with time. Grab your game suit, let's get a move on. Roxanne wasn't surprised it was her. She'd gotten past every level in a fraction of the time anybody else had even got close to. Her chest heaped with pride, but the look behind her eyes was not one of confidence. She knew the stories. She'd heard about Angela and Eva before her, and Maxine, and Paula, and on and on. At the entrance of the Holy Run, the first, first both looked up at her with determination. The smaller of the two reached up to Roxanne's shoulder and gave a small squeeze and smiled in the most sincerely sweet way she'd ever seen. It chilled her to the bones. And don't forget to jump and then duck right away on level four. That one always got me. It'll be just fine. It's only a game. The doors opened and shut behind her, and the game began. Dar handed me a small, thin cup of Turkish coffee and said, drink. I don't drink coffee. But she said she could glean my future, near and distant, from the coffee grounds left after I drank it. Fascinated, I drank and gave her the cup. She studied the bottom of the cup, her small forehead wrinkled in concentration. All I can see is your near future, uh, tomorrow night to be exact. Such a narrow scope of soothsaying was a delicious new concept for me. I'm curious. Look, I'm biting. She extracted her arm and said, Tomorrow, you'll hook up with one of the most beautiful girls you've ever seen. Hmm. Sex? Sex? With a stunningly beautiful girl. It's very, very clear here. Also, says you'll have one child, but not tomorrow. Tomorrow night. Sex for you, you bloody pig. Better shave your uh, sorry mug first. Give me strange urges of dialing 911. The next night, I went to the drum and I went to the drum and dance. I needed sleep and was feeling a bit dizzy, but Dar said, you know, so I went. 
I thought, I'm not in the mood for gratuitous sex. I'm not really looking to hook up after a long and complicated relationship. It ended well, but left me wanting something more than just casual sex. <laughs> but I went, and there I was, uh, dancing around the room in ecstasy, deliciously bouncing off fellow revelers, sweat starting to mist my naked torso. When I saw them, one small and dark-haired with glasses, managed both to radiate a deep intellect and um, uncertainty, and the other, slim, live, supple, deep pale skin, huge green eyes. She looked almost elfin, and radiated that easy, profound confidence of someone used to being stared at and wanted. She was ostentatious, patronizing, arrogant, <laughs> conceited, but beautiful, uh, impossibly beautiful. A hottie hottie, I thought. Your head held high, your body posturing its superiority every minute. Must be tiring. Look at the insolent way with which you scope the room, asserting your superiority. But good goddess, you're so lovely. So out of some pure impulse and feeling like I was in a predictable dream, I danced toward her and pulled her to the dance floor. Her eyes went very wide, but she went with me and pulled the other girl behind her. We danced, the three of us, her aloof and aware of her movement, me and her friend more with the spirit of the event, losing ourselves in the music, allowing our bodies to flow and sway to the beat. Fast forward to the after party. I realized that I'm a part of nearly, uh, I realize that I'm a part of a nearly scripted play that has played before in different venues. Nicolette, that was her improbable name. Uh, she explained why it was so cool. I, I don't remember. I just played my part. It was clear that I had a good connection with her more conventionally named friend, uh, Susan, Holly, I, I forget. It's an old name. Uh, she has, Nicolette snorted in my ear, an uncharacteristic crush on you. Very cute. It was suddenly clear that Nicolette had some cruel streak and compelled her to take me away. It's time to give this thing a, a different ending, I thought, but then Nicolette was on me and in my arms, and Dar said, mm, you know, and good goddess, and she was lovely, and the guys there were giving me withering, envious looks. And I was dizzy, dizzy, and her mouth was minty, and the whole thing just wasn't real. And <laughs> the sex was very, was a very predictable all-nighter, uh, and I played my part. <laughs> she made the right sounds, put on a great show, but her eyes were almost as dull as the conversation that led to that point. And some part of me stepped aside with great disgust and was just thinking about a Durrell book I just read. So Susan, or Holly, or, or whatever your name is, I wanted to tell you that I picked the wrong girl. I want to go back and pull away from Nicolette and take you in my arms instead. I want to make you feel like the most beautiful girl in the world because I would have realized that if I wasn't caught up in my self-glorifying rut. I would have started to heal all those other times when guys didn't as much as glance at you but stared at her hung hungrily. I would have smoothed over the times where they only approached you to ask about your friend. I want to know your name so I can whisper it to you and moan it at you and add various terms of endearment to it. I want to turn you over and massage you until you fall asleep. You quoted that line from The Dispossessed about not having to be a fish to know how to swim. How could I have possibly overlooked that? Forgive me? I'm really excited for this third story. At least I imagine I am. I don't know what it's about, but I love the name. It's called Sylvester the Fox. It is written by Annalise Kane, and it is going to be read by Nori Mizzone. Hi. Hi. Well, that's, that's really bright. All right, so I'm supposed to really lean into this 
sucker. If you can't hear me, let me know. Sylvester the Fox. Sylvester the Fox was a liar. He told a big, fat lie. It was a good lie, too. The best lies are clean cut and painless. Relatively painless. And it was, it had been painless. At least for the chicken. It couldn't feel pain if it was already dead. When he brought the carcass home to his family, they were so proud it weirded him out. Well, his mom was overcome with pride, saying over and over again, my Sylvester's a provider, he's providing for us. His sister Jacqueline wasn't so quick to bring out the party favors. Where to snatch it from? The first coop on South Street. Only one, only one chicken. I'm fine with any, Sylvester's mother piped in. The blonde girl had already herded more than half of them back into the coop. The girl was there, his sister said. Why don't you just tell us the whole story, sweetie? He took a deep breath and flipped his wispy tail back and forth nervously. Jacqueline made fun of him for it. It had always been sort of thin. She suggested his anxiety was causing him to bald prematurely. Well, I was prowling the outskirts of the backyard. The girl had been herding them in, and there were three chickens left. And then, suddenly, completely out of the blue, the girl just ran back to the house, and she had forgotten to close the gate. So I thought, um, I knew I had to be quick. I saw this one, and I fixed in on it. I ran over, and I, I caught her leg. Then I potted her until I could uh, get to her neck, and then I, uh, I snapped it in half with my jaws. His mother's yelp shot up like a geyser. She hustled over to him and grabbed his jaw. Let me see those choppers. He tried to push her away. Mom, stop, it's no big deal. Let a mother do her job. Let me see those killer teeth. She curled up his lip to see one of his incisors. I said, stop it. He pushed her off. The silence popped in their ears. Sylvester was not a forceful fox. His mother stroked her tail to stop the hairs from sticking straight up. You're not my little pup anymore, and I'm very proud of you. And without another word, she rushed into the kitchen to prepare the chicken. Jacqueline eyed him, and he slinked away before she could take a stab at him with her inquisitions. A half an hour later, the chicken was ready. Sylvester could barely open his mouth. Jacqueline wouldn't quit looking at him. But when it came time, she ate the chicken anyway. Sylvester figured that was about as much, as accept as much acceptance as he was going to get. He did not eat the chicken. He wanted to try, but he couldn't stomach it. His mother said that was OK. Almost nobody ate their first chicken. There was some squirrel left over from the winter, but it was brittle and kind of stringy. Hardly a celebratory meal, but that was OK. Sylvester didn't want to feel like a winner. After dinner, Jacqueline and Sylvester went to their respective halves of the bedroom, marked by worn duct tape plastered to the floor. Still, not a word. It was making him a little jumpy. It had been two years since his sister had killed her first chicken. She had been rowdy and boisterous the whole night. She howled and laughed like she wanted to hack something up. But when she went to bed, it was like something took her voice. She turned away from Sylvester's side of the room and slept in late the next day. He figured he should follow the same pattern. She nodded at him before she climbed into bed, and he wondered what that meant. As he looked up at the ceiling, trying desperately to fall asleep, he had an imaginary conversation with his sister. I didn't really kill the chicken. I know. Really? Was I that obvious? Yeah, you were. Tell me about it. He licked his lips. It was hard to describe. Well, I was out by the first coop on South Street. That part was true. And I was looking around. Did you want to kill the chicken? I just wanted to watch them. I figured the more I watched them, the less scary it would be to kill them. So I was just watching, and I saw this girl herding the chicken into the barn. But she was really angry for some reason. 
She would chase a chicken around the giant tree growing in the coop. And when she caught it, she had this scary look in her eyes, like she wanted to crush it. She caught them by the feet and flipped them over, but they would squawk and make a big fuss. I didn't know why she thought this would help, but she started beating them on the ground. I think it helped with two of them. They stopped flailing, but one she hit too hard and she snapped its neck. And I saw it. I saw all of that anger just disappear from her eyes and I saw her get so scared. She put it down and it rolled around like a worm. Then she ran to the house and I took my chance. I grabbed the chicken and ran. How to get all those holes in it. <sighs> Sylvester felt like he was swallowing a toad. Well, I got out of sight of the barn and uh, I, I bit into the chicken. It was the most unpleasant thing he had ever done. It wasn't at all like the chicken he ate at home. This one was raw and bloody and not quite dead yet. He could feel the chicken's jerks of pain when he bit into its chest. And when it was bloody enough and the chicken was almost gone, Sylvester looked up and saw its eyes. They didn't close, even when his mother cooked it. The other chicken's eyes were always closed. Yeah, this stuff is scary, Jacqueline said. Do you forgive me? Sylvester fell asleep trying to imagine his sister's answer. Okay, so not about a fox that was prancing around in like a field of daisies or something, like I maybe thought it would be. Guys, that's kind of dark. There's some dark shit. We're getting dark. Good. Okay. Um, next story. Who's having a good time? Woo! Oh, you guys are way rowdier than you were when I first came up here. Okay, good. I'm glad. Um, okay, I would like to introduce our next story and our next reader. Katie's Moment it is written by John Green, and it is going to be read by our friend, Coriana Moffat. I felt the familiar weight of a body gone slack above me. His deep exhalation had purged the awkward, ragged breathing that moments ago punctuated the staccato up and down of our bodies. I reached through his skin and out the back of him toward the ceiling of my apartment and touched it. With my mind made up to hold on to time for a second. I needed to think. I think a lot. My problems had nothing to do with the amount of thought I give things. In fact, I would wager I think longer and harder about most things than most people. The evidence of that sagged on top of me while I exerted my will over time itself, stretching sad, embarrassing moments of denouement. How did I get here? When we were still at school, Tanya and Shannon would joke with me about moments more literal than now, blacking out, then waking up in a stranger's dorm or apartment. Remember opening your eyes, rolling over and finding yourself on an unknown couch, bed, or atop a comfortable pile of dirty laundry? We had a little catchphrase, the three of us. Close your eyes and try to backtrack to where the night began. I knew where I was. I was stopping time in my apartment after another mistake. How did I get here? The question persisted. Let's like a question and more like something deeper, chemical, instinctual. It bubbled up like run, fight, or I need to piss. 
I needed to piss. How did I get here? Six weeks back, I had split with Bobby, the ex-baseball player for Rob in Firefighter Academy, and Bobby alerted Rob to the overlap. He was not calm under pressure, and I'm pretty sure a felony assault charge isn't helping his chances at joining the city's bravest. I had gotten the girls together for what was supposed to be a night of commiseration and the appropriate emotion-numbing, self-confidence-boosting, mistake-filled, wine-fueled bender. I was on my mother's front porch, knee-deep in a box of Pinot Grigio and nibbling on a half a Kalana pin when my girls turned on me. Tanya looked at Shannon and then looked back at me. Her face transformed to a mask of faux concern before digging through her knockoff coach bag, pulling out a rhinestone dagger and stabbing it through my left tit and into my heart. Katie, we're worried about you, she bleated. Our 20s were fun and we wished they could go on forever too, but we need to move on. She hissed. When are you going to end this self-destructive cycle? She hee-hawed. You need to wean yourself off of these aggressive man-children and find a guy who respects you for you. She buzzed. You know, I miss, the, I miss the excitement and the danger of guys like Ron and all, but there's something to be said about being able to come home to my boring old Pete after work. She farted through the rectum that is her mouth. <laughs> it's Rob. I mentioned chewing the pin like it was a tic-tac. What? She asked the word, word rumbling out of her fat skull like an errant note from a detuned sousaphone. His name was Rob, not Ron. Shannon looked pitiful as my words prompted Tanya to stop twisting her knife and yank it from my less perky than the day before bosom. Shannon was weak. She would never take sides. She would find two new best friends before willingly, will, willfully engaging in conflict. Maybe she wanted two new best friends. I wouldn't blame her. I was in the situation I was in, and Tanya had painted on the makeup of holier than thou, as thick as it could be applied to the face of a girl who fucked a mater d on the weekend of her bachelorette party. <laughs> I went out alone that night. Going out alone is a good way to make new friends, get kidnapped, or fall prey to the whims of an aggressive German businessman. <laughs> Two weeks later, I met up with the girls for brunch in an effort to let vodka, horseradish, and tomato juice wash away the bad taste of our last encounter. Pete has a work thing on Wednesday. There are going to be some nice guys there. There is this one guy I think you might like. He used to have a wild streak himself, I guess, but Pete said he has cleaned it up. She oinked at me. Sounds fun, was what I managed to respond with instead of, remember that Dutch guy we had a threesome with while we were both dating other people? Or, Remember when you spent the, the red money your parents gave you on a bunch of coke down in Puerto Rico and cried until your dad paid for the month you missed? Sounds fun kept Shannon feeling comfortable. Maybe she didn't need two new best friends. She probably thought while mentally thumbing over the new number in her phone and contemplating hitting delete. Holding on to a friendship as you get old and grow apart is as difficult as stopping time and holding on to a moment to analyze the same phenomenon, which is why I love Shan. I need to answer this more than I need to empty my bladder. How did I get here? That week, I went to Pete's work thing. The guy they tried to set me up with, with was a chooch. He must have prepped him, and it backfired. He came on way too strong, drank way too much, and told way too many dumb stories about the lame times working at this crazy startup. <laughs> 
I compared him to Rob and Bobby. I compared him to Andreas, the tennis loser. Mike, the speed freak. Sully, the fighter. Kevin, the drummer. Ollie, the short. Greg, the rock climbing guy. Other Greg, whose hobbies and occupations I was unaware of, but fucked for three months while dating Greg, the rock climbing guy, making for a very confusing autumn two years back. <laughs> what was I supposed to do? Settle like Shannon settled? Find a guy like her husband Chris, who was only skinny for two summers of his life. The summer he, was, he met Shannon, and the summer he proposed. After they got hitched, he traded the abs he was just getting to know for a loyalty card at Chipotle. Sure, <laughs> he's devoted and pays his bills on time, but Christ! Or Tanya's Pete. Pete used to be cool and DJ this night when people used to still DJ nights in this town, but now what? He was funny and used to dress well. Uh, he still dresses well, but he watches fucking BBC mystery shows and writes reviews on obscure bands on a website no one cares about. Then it dawned on me. Pete was who Tanya wanted me to be with. Well, not exactly, but it was who she described. His willingness to be lame for her cured her of being a fucking train wreck, and she was pushing me to find something similar to help me slow down and get off safely at the next station. No. She was waving and laughing at my train as it careened past. When she looks at herself in the mirror, she not only sees that Mater D, she sees over his shoulder to the corner of the room where I was laughing and chugging champagne. She sees that she needs to make it go away or transform that memory and the 10 years of memories and blackouts that looked, sounded, smelled, tasted, and felt like that one into something different. Not the three of us, young and stupid, figuring it out, but nasty old fucked up Katie leading the good girls astray. She was changing the story for herself because the truth was, before I met those two, I was the good girl who had always passed in her homework on time and only kissed one boy in high school. How could she recast the movie of our lives with our roles reversed? Her name is fucking Tanya, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> so that's how I got here frozen in time with my best friend husband on top of me on some random fucking Tuesday. Because this is the day she goes to advanced yoga. I whispered into his shoulder. I want to change. I want to find the right thing for me. I want to find my way. I want to not show up to work hung over and out of it three days of the week. I remove my hand from the ceiling and weave it out from his back and through his chest and let time flow back into the room. Get up, I move. I need to take a piss. <laughs> shit, guys, right? <laughs> oh, shit. That's like the only thing I can think of that was listening to that story. It was like, oh, shit, right? I mean, plus we all know one of those people. Every, the, the thing about that story is every single person in this room is like, Oh, I know one of the people that was just mentioned in that story. Even if it's just like Greg who rock climbs, you're like, oh yeah. Um, yeah. Some dark shit. Some dark. Right, sexy and dark. I love that combination. Great. Um, we have another story for you. Who's ready for it? Um, really excited to bring up. The story is called My Brother's Friend. It is written by Benito Henri, and it is to be read by Sasha Nudam. Are all men 
naked right now. <laughs> My brother had a friend that he used to hang out with in elementary school, and they were inseparable. They got into trouble all the time, and our teachers were extremely livid with their consistent shenanigans. One day, after school, my brother and his friend decided to race. They told me to stand where I was and to watch from behind. My brother and his friend took off instantly, and I was in awe at how fast they were able to run. After a couple of moments, though, I couldn't see my brother's friend anymore. All I could see was my brother's back, and he was standing as still as a statue. I ran up to catch with him, and I noticed that he had the most frantic look on his face, as if he had witnessed the murder. I asked what was wrong, and his response shook me to my core, and I am still haunted by it today. My brother told me he was right next to his friend, and he heard him say goodbye, and he watched him disappear right before his eyes. The trek from Dorchester to Alston was almost an hour on the tee. I was tired from late community outreach for work and had to be in the office again in the more early morning. To say I wasn't supposed to be at the show was an understatement. And yet there I was, compelled by some force that I thought was the love of funk and soul music. And so I swayed to the rhythm, enjoying my own company with a drink in my hand that was rushing to my head faster than I intended. And the room was filling up, and by the second or third act, we were next to each other, part of a crowd naturally organized into shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder lines. We kept bumping into each other, probably accidentally at first. I wanted to say sorry or anything, but it was loud, and when I looked away for a second and back, you had disappeared. I was disappointed for another second that I missed my chance to talk to you, then you floated back with the beer in hand and inserted yourself back into the crowd next to me. I grabbed the nook of your arm and smiled at you. We instantly started talking, and it didn't take long for the music to move our bodies together. Your hand was on my hip and your French accent was crooning into my ear. It was your kind eyes that got to me, though. Joe Aquino, or Joe Aquino, the Italian version of Joaquin. Six feet tall, lean, with hazel eyes. I wanted to climb you when I first saw you. Thank you for waiting outside the bathroom in between acts to make conversation with me. You kissed me during songs and held me close, and I didn't mind it. The ease of us, the magnetism. It was like I came that night to meet something lovely, and it was you. I didn't go home with you that night when you asked, mainly because I had work in the morning, but also because I hoped that that wouldn't be it. So I saved my number into your phone and peeled myself away from you, smiling dizzily in the Uber ride across town. We met up again just as easily the next evening at an alleyway restaurant, your favorite, Spizzy in the North End. We talked about family and goals and culture over pasta and wine. It was during the shared tiramisu that I knew I'd give myself to you that night. If dancing and laughing and talking were this easy with you, I knew it would come more fruitfully. It was only natural, though, that my heart sink when you broke the news to me. I am moving to LA on Thursday. 
I am three days left to know you. I told you I had to get some drinks with friends in the Fenway area, but that I'd see you after. When I came to your doorstep later that night, tipsy again, you were already there waiting for me with open arms. We made love in a hot room as I started getting sniffly from your cat. You were gentle and patient, doing all the things I liked without having to be asked. You knew your way around me and inside me, and I savored you. But when I could no longer handle my cat allergy, you waited outside with me to talk, not rushing me out. You did everything right, and I'm naming it all because I'm not used to good men. It was 3 a.m. when I took a Benadryl in my own bed, wishing I could have been sleeping next to you, swollen eyes and all. We agreed to meet again on Monday, only because Saturday and Sunday were busy for me, hosting a housewarming party and attending another friend's party. You suggested Mexican food in a movie. White, white tablecloths or fast food. You're the type of guy that could easily eat at either type of restaurant and still be great company. I loved seeing more dogs with you. Miles Teller and Jonah Hill have a great chemistry that clicked on screen that made the story work. I'd like to say the same about our off-screen chemistry. You came back to mine, and I snuck you into my bedroom away from my early-to-bed roommates. Your hands and mouth devoured me, and I received you eagerly. I'd never fallen asleep so easily on a man's chest before, but you had me comfortable, cheek to chest. I loved being awoken to you wanting more of me, as if you craved my body in your dreams. In the morning, I made breakfast for you and took you to my favorite Vietnamese shop to get a banh mi sandwich and iced coffee. We'd fallen into this rhythm of me working during the day and anticipating when we'd see each other again in the evening. I didn't want to think about you packing up during the day when we had just begun unpacking each other. The last evening I saw you, I dressed up a little. I put on the most flattering little black dress I owned and even a bracelet. I suggested we try the South End since you hadn't made it out there yet and to try your first tapas restaurant. We joked about the couple dining next to us and how they were clearly on a first date, probably arranged by an app. It made me realize that no algorithm could have brought us together, can make me reach over so often to be closer to you, to hold not only your hand but your arm across the table. For someone who had to be at the airport in the morning, you drink your wine slowly in no apparent hurry to leave your current situation. In the Uber ride back to my place, you grabbed my hand from across the back seat and I leaned it. I leaned it to you all night. The next day, you'd be on the other side of the country. My favorite thing about you is your easy nature and your witty banter. I love how far you take jokes with me, like when we said I'd be waiting outside the theater with a sign for any other guy to go on a date with me, or how you said our story would be an Oscar award-winning short film, or that I'm Angelica Memory because my last name is spelled almost like Wacuerdo, meaning memory in Spanish. I like that you wanted to be a rock star when you grow up, and the stories you'd tell me while we were naked in bed. I think you're incredibly sexy and kind and full of life. I don't know if and when I'll ever see you again, but thank you for one week of sultry summer bliss. I mean, do I even need to say it? Do I even need to say about how sexy the night is? Also, guys, that was just like an unironic, pleasant story about a man. Can we talk about that? Great. Uh, I, I was sort of like, is this really just like a really nice story about a really nice man? It is? It's amazing. <laughs> okay. How I Forgot You, written by Kelly Smith and read by Victoria George. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. The first thing to go was the coffee maker. Not because it was yours, or because the smell reminded me of you, but rather, it occurred to me one morning that your head is shaped, shaped like a coffee pot. <laughs> Frankly, your ears stick out like the handle does, and I realized I could not start my morning pouring coffee from your head 
and then be expected to go about my day. <laughs> so I got rid of it and forgot about it. Other objects in my apartment went next. Little things like pictures were changed out of frames, and then frames were eliminated altogether. Phases became bags of shattered glass to take out with the trash. Placemats became doormats, which became welcome mats until they were dumpster insulators. Forks had no home here. I pulled books off shelves, wrenched the words we loved from their spines, and tossed the pages down onto the street below. But I uh, ran downstairs and caught them before they hit the ground. I couldn't have strangers picking up the pages and reciting them to me if we ever crossed paths. I emptied my arms full of words into barrels I found behind our Chinese restaurant three blocks up. Smelling of old lo mein and crab rangoon, I hoped it would suffice. Our couch was fatally infested with kisses and Sunday morning cinnamon rolls. So I watched as the moving men drove it away from me, and I waved and hollered, goodbye, you old couch. I'll miss you. Never. <laughs> the rest of the furniture soon followed with the same gusto. But standing in my empty apartment, I ran out of things to forget, and I hadn't forgotten you. So I left. Once you start forgetting and eliminating things, it becomes easy to keep going. I walked further from my apartment. I closed my eyes and forgot restaurants we liked and hated, parks we had laid down in, goodbye bench, goodbye graffiti, goodbye hats. Blink, and it never happened. I eventually forgot music, but I didn't lose sound. Instead of notes and pregnant chords, I gained the buzzing of mosquitoes, the crinkling of paper, and the hum of computers. I gained constant sound. People were harder. I separated from all the Andrews I knew, and, which was a shame because I had a fine dentist named Andrew, <laughs> and even a childhood dog. I was sad, but the Andrews had to go. I forgot, and I forgot until I had nothing to remember. But how do you forget a word? A word is seen, or heard, or said, and then it destroys everything you've worked for. It's the word living in the impossible space between two hands holding each other. It's the word in every song that means something. It's the word that whispers both keep going and stand perfectly still. L, a remarkable journey beginning with, I like you. Oh, Otis writing records vibrating, making the table dance with us. B, existing in comfortable, vulnerable silence. E, love like caramel and euphoniums. How do you forget a word? How do you forget a word? I returned to my apartment exhausted. I grasped for the light, ready to be relieved by the emptiness of my apartment, but instead, the light showed all the memories I had forgotten to forget. Our third date in Providence stood next to a fish called Wanda. Meeting your mother was next to my grandmother's funeral. Spilled coffee, David Bowie, and Big Tony's Deli, everything was there. These were the memories that had no couch cushions to bury into, no tables to hide behind, no dust to take cover beneath. I never forgot you. I missed you. We sat on the floor, each memory and I. We had a cup of tea and I let them remind me of what they were and what they meant. I moved between memories around my apartment until the night 
told me it could no longer wait for day. The sun began to rise as our final argument quietly grabbed its hat and passed through the door. I sat, and I forgot about forgetting you. Eventually, I think you don't have to forget in order to remember without pain. I sat, remembering you, and missing you, and missing we. Sort of breaking up with each other right now because it shows that. <laughs> but before we do that, can we hear it again for all of our writers and all of our readers? <laughs> all of the people who put this show together, the food now. And before you all head out, I would like to bring up the CMs for one final thought. <laughs> okay, just me because actually Coriana's in the back. Um, remember, if Please contribute because we pay our readers and our writers and the idea is that you contribute to the art in the community. So, we have Coriana's boots. Coriana's in the back of the boot. I have a boot. <laughs> Jackie has a hat. And I have a square. So if you don't have cash, don't just sneak away. Come find me. $5 suggested donation. Please uh, help contribute. Also, next up, in the main room, just to make sure that we give a shout out to them, Aubrey Haddard is going to be performing with Josh, and she told me his last name, but it was complicated, so you'll have to go <laughs> to find that out. And then at 10 p.m., we have a band from London. This is the first stop on their tour. How cool is that? And their name is Albino, so you should stick around and drink more air and not beer. But first, you should give us $5. And check out the stuff on the back and come see us again. Thank you.